God bless you. It's nice to be here and it's a blessed experience for us to be gathered here on a Friday. On a Friday. It's like you guys have nothing to do. You decided to come here on a, <laughs> on a Friday. It's a busy day on a Friday because you're catching up and uh, the week has come to an end and you've been working and now you want to rest and meet up with your friends and go for a, a religious party. Am I right? And you decide to come here and to listen to a, a sermon on preaching. Now, that's very, very interesting. Let me, let me share with you what you probably will agree with. And that is preaching, uh, you may not believe me, used to be one of those um, what is preaching? One of those disciplines that was only done by intelligent people. You have to be very intelligent for you to preach. So people would go to school for no less than seven years after high school so you can preach. You would not be able to preach if you didn't do that because it was difficult, it was complicated, and it needed people who are intellectuals, people who are uh, uh, profound thinkers to do, uh, to do preaching. But today, it's the opposite. If you can't reason, you can be a good preacher. Have you noticed that? <laughs> I say, you know, he used to be a good preacher until he went to school. <laughs> You've heard that. He said, no, he was okay, and then he went to Helderberg, and then he went and he did his PhD in preaching, but now you can't even hear what he says. But that guy who is only a standard three, that's the best preacher. Uh, he, he, he preaches and... So now it looks like preaching is literally uh, being assigned to those who may not necessarily be very... Uh, and, and sometimes even in life, you find that they're not really <laughs> thinkers. They're just preachers, you know? And, uh, and people don't want... When, when a person says to you, don't preach to me, and he says, now you are sounding preachy. You know, like, please stop sermonizing. When they say that, they are saying, you do not understand my situation. Which means that's the definition of preaching. Preaching is, and preachers and a sermon is that uh, exercise of saying things that don't make sense because they're not linked to reality. So when people preach, you say, ah, let them preach. It's meant to be like that. You don't have to understand it. It's, a, it's, it's, it's a spiritually descend. You know, you have to have spiritual gift to understand preaching. It's deep and profound spiritually. No, there's no logic in preaching. Logic is for those who are going to hell. In heaven, <laughs> we don't use logic. Uh, when you say, but what do you mean? You can't ask what do you mean in preaching. It means you are far from the Lord. <laughs> and so preaching has been covered in this mystery. And we want to try and demystify it and say preaching is another way of communicating. It is communicating God's way. All the elements of good communication apply also to preaching. Like knowing your subject. Like knowing the audience you are talking to. Like knowing how to communicate, to express, to articulate. And many other things that you find in preaching. Preaching um, is, is falls under persuasive speech. You need to, some people even argue that you must also uh, do some argumentative theories. You must know how to argue. You must know how to reason logically. You know, if you want to convince and persuade people. Uh, you must know how to reason from cause to effect. You must know how to uh, uh, look at necessary implication in the context. You must know how to look at evidential proof in, the, in what you are reading and be able to communicate that. Uh, so they say, but of course you don't believe that. You know, you, say, ah, you have to say it because you do it. That's your day job. So everybody speaks well of what he does. But the beauty of preaching is that all of us who are working with Christ are, have been given the burden or the task 
to share what we believe. It's preaching. You may not be standing behind the pulpit with a mic and whatever, but the fact that you want to share what you believe, you want to tell somebody about Christ, that's in a way preaching. I mean, in the, in the, in the technical sense. I know when you, you hear preaching, you hear emotions and excitement and, and talking and, and talking and talking until you, you, you forget why, why you are talking. But, but, but technically, preaching is communicating a message to a person, understanding where he comes from, and, and meeting, meaning and, 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 and the context and the situation. And then you say, oh, now I see. In other words, it's supposed to be one of those disciplines that help you also to face life and to move on in life and uh, to, to, to make it. Now I can ask you a question. We're going to look at that. Who is your best preacher? When you understand who your best preacher is, it means there are certain things that he does that you like. That you like, yeah, that's beautiful. I like that. You know, I like that. Um, I, I think I have also my best preacher. Uh, some of them are maybe dead by now, but, but I used to have best preachers until I started preaching seriously. Then I discovered that even the best are also struggling, you know. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you have your best preachers, and then you will see today why your best preachers are, are your best preachers. We'll tell you why they are your best preachers. Uh, Pastor Seb, thank you for your introduction. Uh, the text he read, 2 Timothy 4, verse 2, and the first sentence there, that verse says, preach the word. Preach the word. And that's what we're going to be looking at this weekend, uh, most of the time when we meet. Uh, in other words, we want to look at text-driven and text-based sermons. Full stop. There's a lot that we can say about preaching. But this is what we're going to do. Text-driven. Text-based. In other words, uh, we want to hear the text. We want to, see, to hear God's word speak to us. Now, it says, preach the word. It doesn't say preach your words. It doesn't say preach your opinion. Sometimes we don't preach the word, but we preach our opinion about the word. But we want to let the word be audible. We want to say, if Christ were to stand here as I am preaching, this is what he would say. Now that's, that's heavy. Now that's tough. You know, you've got, to, you've, got to, you've got to take it, they call it exposition. Exposition, you've got to expound uh, uh, unfold, interpret, give us the meaning of what we, are, what, what, what we have just read. Not only the meaning, but the significance. So the meaning is, answers the question, what does it mean? That's the meaning. I know that, that's not profound. But the significance, significance says, so what? So what? Christ is the way, so what? What's the significance? And if you don't show me the significance, even the meaning is meaningless. So if the meaning and the significance, and people lose it when they get the meaning and we spend time, we give the meaning, and then we say, but how does that apply in my life here in Google, in Ethelon, in Mowbray? Because when preaching doesn't address your situation, when it doesn't give you answers, we say, Jesus is the answer. I used to have a program. Some many years ago in Radio Siskai, those of you who will remember. And the title, the thing for the program was Jesus is the Answer. And each time I would start the program, I would say, any one of you remembers that program? I would say, Jesus is the Answer, but what are the questions? <laughs> you know, because to, to come up with answers when you're not even aware of the questions is, 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 is being, is, is, it's, a, is, is, is another way of being a fraudster. That's fraudulent. That's fraud. You can't, you, can't, you, can't, you can't come up, you can't present answers when you don't know the questions. It's not right. It's unethical. But what are the questions? So preachers are supposed to be having their ears on the ground, hearing the questions and giving the answers. And when that happens, then, then we use the word, the term relevant. Relevant. It may be true, but is it Relevant. So if all we do in preaching is to prove that it is true, then we have done nothing. Until people see the relevancy, how does it help? I've just lost a boyfriend and you are preaching. How does that help me? A 
I say, my sister, those things are earthly things. <laughs> and then, and then you say, but I'm here on earth. <laughs> Shouldn't we talk about those earthly things? Don't worry about earthly things. We're going to heaven. But how are you going to get there? How are you going to get there? And then you begin, you begin to worry that if heaven is not interested in my, on my, in my planet, I don't know. And some of us want to go to heaven. Because if we don't go there, we will go to hell. All right. So, <laughs> so we'd rather go to heaven. Whatever that is, let's go there than go and burn in hell. All right. But there's something that says in our hearts at times that even heaven is going to be boring, but it's better to be, to be bored in heaven than to burn in hell. <laughs> but boredom can be burning. You can burn with boredom. And you go to heaven, you are there for eternity, and you are bored. <laughs> you would wish you, had, you went to hell and died. Because there you will be burning for, forever. I mean heaven. You will be burning forever. Because you will be bored. You try this. People are excited and they're singing with the angels. <laughs> and there you are. You say, oh, can't you change the hymn? <laughs> <laughs> and there they are eating beautiful things and you looking for Kentucky Fried Chicken. And they say, there's no Kentucky Fried Chicken. And he says, oh, for, it, for forever. <laughs> Maybe that's my phone. I don't know. Let's switch off our phones. Those of us who have phones, um, that can be switched off. Let's, let's switch them off. Some of these phones are manufactured and you can't do anything. Once they switch off, that's the end. All right, let's look, at, let's look at some of these things. What we're going to do this week, let me tell you what we're going to do so that those who are here and you won't come again, at least you know. We're going to do one thing, and this is it. Four things. Actually, three, but let's, let's make them four. They're not here in, a, in, my, in my introduction. Four things. And we'll do that until Sunday we leave. It's that one, preaching is reading the text. You can't preach if you have not read the text. I know people who just preach and they, they say, oh, I forgot to read the text. But you have not preached. Preaching is, is reading the text, explaining the text, illustrating the text, applying the text, and then sit down. Read the text, explain it. There's a lot involved in explaining and illustrate it. So we can see that this thing is real. Can we switch off our phones? And lastly, apply it. So we're going to be looking at those things throughout the week. But let me just share with you, if you don't mind, uh, my favorite preacher, and that preacher is Jesus Christ. And I'm going to tell you why Christ is, is my favorite preacher, and I'm sure you will also agree with me that he is indeed a favorite preacher, uh, a model, a model uh, of a preacher. In, in Luke 4, verse 32, I'm just going to read this text. Luke 4, verse 32. Oh, some of the things we're going to be looking at during the week, all right? So, um, in Luke 4, verse 32, it says here, and they were astonished. Verse 32 says, then he went down to Capernaum, a city of Galilee, and was teaching them on Sabbaths, on the Sabbaths. And they were astonished at his teaching, for his word was with authority. They were astonished at his... They've heard people who preach. And preaching and teaching, you will see, we will bring those together. Because if you cannot teach, if, if you are a preacher but you cannot teach, then you're going to have a serious problem. They were astonished at his teaching. You can say stroke preaching. They were astonished at his teaching because he spoke to them as one who had authority. Now you want to know why Christ was effective in his preaching? He spoke as one who had authority. Now, 
There are many ways of having authority. You can have authority by coaching people who have authority. And then you hide behind their authority. You say, Dr. So-and-so said this. The moment you say that, what you are saying then is supposed to be true. Because Dr. So-and-so made that statement. All right? Or you can, you yourself become a doctor. So that even that thing you used to say and nobody listened. Now, because you're a doctor, then they start listening. As if, if, if they don't understand, they say, ha, ah, that was profound. If he's a doctor, he should know what he's talking about. So you get your authority from your academic qualification. All right? But where did Christ get his authority? He spoke to them as one who had authority. Now let's go through and then we'll look at some of those things that can, that makes us appreciate who Christ was. When you think of Christ, do you think of Christ as, let me see, do you think of Christ as a 30-year-old? Let's see those who are 30 years here. I know ladies don't want to know their age. My wife had a problem with me one day. I said, you know, my wife is, is and I just said the age. Then, then as we were going, I could see she's not okay. I said, but what's wrong? Never, ever, again, <laughs> tell people my age. <laughs> so I had to get a lecture. I never, I never fully understand. Even on my Facebook, I say, Papu, born 1961, 15 September. That's, I don't know why you should hide that. I'm 50 years, I'm going to be 51 in, 19, in September 15th. But people just write, born September. When, when? Born 15th, when? Where's the date? What's the date? <laughs> All right, so I'm old fashioned. Okay. Let me see the 30-year-old. Just stand if you're a 30-year-old. 30 30-year-old. 30 Okay, you're looking at these 30-year-olds. You're doing that at your own risk. You're looking at these 30-year-olds. Okay, you can sit down. You can sit down. Guys. And I know some of us are even more than 30, but we... <laughs> you look at these guys who just stood up on 30 years. When you think of Christ, do you think Christ was that age? No. Do you think Christ was that young? No. Oh, you know, Christ was like 68 I mean, serious, when you listen to Christ and you hear people talk about Christ, you, as, you, you associate Christ with authority and authority with age. Am I right? Then Christ becomes an... He's not 30. He can't be 30. Now, now I said to, an, uh, to another uh, group of people, I'm older than Christ. I said, ah, that's blasphemy. <laughs> so Christ was a young boy. I'm older than him. He said, no, you can't say that. But that's true. And the reason why we, are, we feel reluctant to say that was the age and what he said. Don't tell him. It's like, no, he was too old for his age. And you hear people who were, who were old and say, even at 12, he confounded quite a few of them. And they said, he's 12 years old, but it looks like he's been here for a long time. I don't know about age, but I was told that some of us can be 30 or 60, only to find that we are in reality 25. Just that there are certain years that we repeated, you know? <laughs> you were 20 for 15 years. <laughs> so even if you are 35, you are still 20 because you are still just repeating, you know? And, and then they argue against, against experience. Now let me share with you yeah, the text we read, he taught them as one with authority and, and not as the scribes. Bizarre of Ages says that. And the scribes were there, they would teach, but not as one with authority. The teaching of the scribes and the elders was cold and formal. A lesson learned by road. Uh, to them, the word of God possessed no vital power. So they would stand there and say what the word says. But there was nothing, the word was not alive as it was in Christ. And it says, yeah, no inspiration touched their hearts. So they, your words could not touch the hearts of the people they were talking to. But now, he, Jesus, um, in, 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 in that very book, page 2, he says, never, his hearers have never perceived such a depth of meaning. Mark that. Because preaching is about meaning. Such a depth of meaning. In other words, he explained the word of God and revealed and unfolded its deeper meaning, what it meant, and people were, 
were astounded. They were surprised. He has, he has, his hearers were, were daily involved in great uncertainty. You know when Christ speaks, he speaks with authority and uncertainty. He doesn't say, well, maybe. Well, uh, well probably. No, there was no probably or maybe. It, that's it. That's it. You see, and this is what is happening in our preaching. Our preaching is a supposition. It's a, it's a suppose. It's a maybe. It's, a, it's an opinion. But with Christ, it was it. That was it. I, I'm not, I'm, now, listen, I'm not saying whenever you stand there, whatever you say must be it. Some of the things you say are a suggestion. Are you with me? You're saying, it would be good for you to spend at least 30 minutes studying your Bible. But you can't say that like it's from the Bible. That's a suggestion. You can say, no, 30 minutes is too little for me. I'll take four. That's fine. Just a suggestion. But I'm talking about things that are taught by the Bible. Even there, we always maybe suppose, you never know, there are a lot of views here, but one of the views like this, and then you end there and say, but hey, just tell us. And, and you know, and this is the difference between the current modern contemporary preaching as opposed to the preaching in the past. Those old people will just come and tell you and they'll hear as if God is speaking. And you come there trembling. But today, it's like, ah, you can take it or leave it because there are others who think this way, there are others who see it this way. You know, it's like it's an academic exercise, you know. But people just want this direct thing. What does God say? Prophets did not come and say, maybe God said, no, thus said the Lord. That is, that, that was it. But during the time of Christ, the scribes and those who were learned had, had come to a point of presenting uncertainty where we created. Yeah, there are others who say we evolved, but, you know, no, we were created. Now, you can fight with that, but at least it's clear. We were created by God, we're not from monkeys. Now, you are free to say that in, an, in a different environment where there are doctors and, 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 and anthropologists and what are these people called who are supposed to be educated, um, and the Bible calls them fools because they deny the existence of God. So you're afraid. But the word is, that's the word. It's not yours. You don't need to be. Uh, they, have a problem. they have a problem with the word, not with you. Especially if you're interpreting as, as you're supposed to. He says he presented his, his whatever subject he dwelt on. It was presented with power. He was earnest but not vehement. What's the difference between being earnest and being vehement? Vehement borders on being insulting. There are some people who think straightforward is being rude. It's like being rude. You are, you are rude. And now, there are preachers who, when they preach, you can tell where they are coming from. That they are coming from a home where they were not disciplined. <laughs> now, they are just hijacking the Holy Spirit to share how uncouth they are under the guise of I'm possessed by the Holy Spirit. I once said to young people, if you are 18 years old, you are 16 years old, or a certain age, there are certain things you cannot preach about. Or there are certain ways you need to express yourself in certain ways. You can't stand up at 16 and say to your parents, some of you are adulterers. <laughs> you, can, you can say, there are people who commit adultery, yeah, but you can't point at your mother. Well, in my, in, my, in my context as an African, you can't do that. Why do you say I'm an adulterer? If, even if it's true, but why do you say that? <laughs> I think we become vehement, and we think we're in the spirit, and we start insulting people, and people get angry, they want to beat us. And you think you're being beaten for the truth, but no, it's for presentation. It's how you present it. Now, read, read that with This print is small, eh? This font is small. The font is not that big, eh? All right. And when you begin to see fonts that are small, then you know your eyes are not getting there. Uh, maybe you need to get some magnifying glass. But, but look at that. It says, Christ's method alone will give true success in reaching the people. Because preaching is reaching the people. And what is it? He mingled with men. He mingled with men as one who desired their good. Christ loved people. A preacher must be somebody who loves people. You can't just be a channel of truth. Truth. You must love people. So that when they hear you speak the truth, they can connect that he is interested in our welfare. You can't just be saying truth. Truth is in a context, but who are you to tell me that truth? You must show love. People must know that you love them. You know, 
They said the best form of evangelism is friendship evangelism. Because when I talk to my friend, she listens to me because there are other things I tell her that are also beneficial. So when I talk to her about Christ, she may disagree, but she knows I mean well. If you don't care about me, why do you care that I should go to heaven? You don't even know where I stay, but you want me to go to heaven. You don't even know what I've eaten this morning, but you want me to go to, go to heaven. You don't want me to go to heaven. It's not true. You know what? I'm going to say this, but it doesn't have to be repeated elsewhere. This one guy said, there's no way white people can, it can be true that there is heaven. They said, no. He said, no, there can't be any heaven. Because we heard it from the whites, there can't be heaven. White people would never tell us if there was heaven. They would just go there and leave us, and leave us here. <laughs> the fact that they are so busy telling us about heaven is a sign that there is no heaven. Because they're not interested in us. How can you lock me in hell and then say I must go to heaven? How can you put me in a township where there's no drainage, where there's no electricity, where there's nothing, and then you say, let's go to heaven? You will not go to heaven with me because you're not interested in my welfare. That's true. That's not being political. That's true. If you don't care about me, why do you want me to go to heaven? And one of the reasons why it is difficult for preachers to connect with young people is when young people discover that you're not interested in them, they shut off, they don't want to listen to you. But when they know that you love them and you are interested in them, they will accept even the most rebuking statements that you will make because they know that you love them. People stand here and they have a problem with young people. They are you young people because they were never young in the church, so they don't understand why, why, why are you doing these things and, and things like that, and they are angry. And then you can see that we are personally personally, I mean this thing is personal he's affected personally it's not God, it's not Christ, it's nothing it's him and people don't like to do things to please you am I right? let me tell you about Christ beloved he, he showed sympathy we will call it empathy today he showed sympathy, he ministered to their needs when churches exist and they, they exist in isolation, they become an island surrounded by poverty and all they do is to preach to people without meeting their needs, then the message of God has become an abomination. Then the last part says he won their confidence. Now he has won their confidence. They are willing to do anything he says. Then he says, follow me. We don't know them. We don't mingle with them. We don't meet their needs. We don't sympathize with them. All we do is follow Christ. No, how am I going to do that? Now, when we mingle, that's like that's the successful formula. When you mingle, you get to know people, then you know, then you hear their questions. And then your sermon, your preaching becomes a response to those questions, to those issues. Now I said this. But a youngster who's 18, a lady who's 18, a youth who's 18, a lady who's 18, 19, or 16, I don't know these ages now. Always got, can get confused. Um, and has a pimple, develops a pimple. It's like bad. I mean, I don't know with you. It's bad. It has a pimple. Now, to me, that's nothing. Even when I preach, I say, worried about pimples. What's that? Listen, if it worries you, it's a problem. Do you know that a person who has lost a loved one, the pain he has, if you were to measure it, it would be the same as the pain that person has of having a pimple. If you were to measure the pain and measure it, it would be the same. The person who has lost a loved one can't even wake up and, and, and go to work tomorrow. He's so drained. And the person with the pimple doesn't even want to wake up because he feels like, how am I going to face the world with a pimple? <laughs> now, if I'm not going to take that seriously, there's no way I'm going to help. I'm going to help. I cannot help you. But if, when I say, okay, let's see. Because it's not the pimple, it's how you look at it. It's your perception of that. And perception is reality. To the one who perceives. So, now, if I'm going to be sympathetic and let you know that I feel for you, even when I talk to you about heaven, you might listen. Am I right? You remember the story of the young man who they were playing and the preacher came and said, I want to show you the way to heaven. Woo! Time is running. I want to show you. We, we, let's end at half past, all right? Can we end at half past? We started late. Just 15 minutes more. 
we're supposed to end at quarter past. We want to take you to heaven. And then, uh, sorry, what am I saying now? I want, I want the way to the hall. That's where I'm going to preach the gospel. Take you to heaven. That's where I'm going to preach the gospel. And then, and then the youngsters said, okay, go this, that, that. And then he says, please come and listen to us. I'm going to be talking about the way to heaven. But the boy says, no, we're not coming. You don't even know the way to the hall. How do you know the way to heaven? <laughs> Or that when we meet their needs, when we become friendly, we need Christians, Adventists, friends. We need to be friends. Some of us have forgotten what it means to be a friend. Be friend. I think we've become so holy that we think to have friends is being earthly. But Christ, who came from heaven, had friends. They even say Lazarus was his friend. He used to go and stay at Lazarus' place and used to enjoy himself. And when Lazarus was sick, he said, the one you love, your friend. Now I'm from heaven. I have no time for earthly human creatures. <laughs> All right, let's move. Uh, let me just share. The most educated were charmed with his words. And the uneducated. You know, some of us, because we think we're educated, we always want to prove that we're educated by being very abstract and complex. But Christ was simple, that even the educated would feel challenged and the uneducated. You know, when he does that, when he addresses the educated and, and, and the educated feels part of the whole thing and the uneducated, he has actually leveled the playing field. He has, he has made the ground level. That the, educa ed, sorry, the educated and the uneducated in his sight are the same. So we want to let people, that's loving the world. We want to let people think that we are important. So we, we get there. Do you, have you ever had an experience of a friend who's your friend until he meets people who are supposed to be better than you and then all of a sudden you're longer his friend? <laughs> he feels that you're going to, going to pull him down your level. And he says, ah, I know, do I know you? No, we were together. Now, this is what Peter did, and Paul rebuked him. Now, he was there with the Gentiles, and they socializing with them, and they were happy with them. And then when the Jews came, he prayed as if he doesn't know them. And Paul says, That's, that is demonic. You must never do that. Tell, telling Peter that. And the problem with us is we always tell and make our messages to this, to this group because we want to appear as if we are at that level. Now, Christ was simple. And to be simple is the most difficult thing. It's easy to be, to be, to be, to be, to be, what's to be complicated. It's easy. But to be simple, so that even the 10 year old says, I know what you preached about. And the one with the PhD says, I was challenged by your message. In the same sermon, in the same congregation, Christ could do that. Being simple, keeping it simple. You know, there are people who compose songs and they make them very difficult. Just keep it simple. You can't have too many transitions. You're confusing us. Just keep the thing simple. Nice, simple. So even when we are out of here, we can sing it. You can't even harm it. You can't even sing it because you can't remember it was so complicated. Just in the same sentence, in the same line, there are 13 transitions and all kinds of little things that come in and go. Lord, have, have mercy. Now, Christ linked himself with the interest of humanity. And this should be followed by everyone who wants to preach his word. Those who receive the gospel of his grace. Link yourself with humanity. Don't stand apart. There are certain, some of us who don't dress that way, we don't eat that way, we don't behave that way. And yet you want to win people who behave that way and dress that way. I don't mean go and dress like them. I don't mean go and eat what they eat. But all I know is Christ was seen amongst the sinners. But it's in the Bible. And they even say he eats with sinners. I don't know. It doesn't say he ate what the sinners were eating. But he eats with sinners. <laughs> Maybe he had his own thing that he brought. I don't know. But <laughs> the Bible says he eats with sinners. He sits there. He sits there. Now when you eat with a person, that means you have accepted that person. Some of us got into, you go to a, a place there in a house, uh, whatever, get in there, you can't even breathe. You close your head, oh, 
But how, how are you going to reach out? You know, there's something about Christ. Beloved, it just touches my heart. You know these guys who had leprosy? Leprosy was bad. That thing would stink. Man. I mean, if a person with leprosy, far away, you would just say, ooh, there's leprosy. I mean, especially if the wind is blowing this way, you just want to run. Everyone would run. Oh. But Christ would never. Christ just looked beyond. He just looked at his creatures who runs from his dirty child. Christ would just come and say, I mean, right there. He did not heal at a distance. He came close to heal. You see, because he could have healed them remotely. Healed. Because that's one get close. Are you with me? That's still healing. No. He would come close, come close. I mean, the stench, you could, you could even touch it. You could even touch it. And then he would touch them and heal them, touch them. Now, when did they stop being leprous? Before he touched them or as he touched them? Yeah. He touched them. Touch those sores, bleeding sores and all kinds. You know, you just touch, touch them. You touch it and they get healed. Never felt like, ooh. That's, but beloved, let me tell you something. Stop preaching if you have no love for people. Go and do something else. Don't come and stand before people if you don't love them. If you don't, ask God to help you love them. Because people will make you very angry. And you'll think you're preaching and you're condemning them. All right? He says that we're not to renounce social communion. We should not seclude ourselves from others. In order to reach all classes, we must meet them where they are. Now, let me tell you something. You can't meet all classes if you are in a lower class. Now, you can't have standard two and say, me, I, 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 I'm, uh, I, I, I love people. No, standard two. Now, we said yesterday, don't be humble because you are not great. Don't. Now, when, when the Bible says be humble, it's not for you because you are not great. It's for people who are great. You are not great. You don't have to be humble. Just be yourself because you are not great. Okay? Now, when we talk about reaching all classes, reaching all classes, we mean that this person is in a class that's there, but is able to reach all classes. You're not going to reach all classes if you are down there. You can only reach your own class. Now, you understand why, even in our preaching, even in our churches, we can only attract the people who are in our class. Because we can't reach... So the challenge is, with Christ, he came from God. He was God. He came from heaven. But he was able to come down. Incarnation was not just a once-off event. On a daily basis, you could see incarnation at and, and being practiced. So he would reach out to the children. He would talk to the children. He would reach out to the educated. He would talk to the scribes. He would talk to the sinners. He would talk to women. He was able to reach. Now, you can do that. Now, that is why it is important as a preacher, first of all, to develop yourself. Don't come and stand and say, yeah, you may have your BA, I'm, I'm born again also. No, we're not talking about that here. <laughs> because if you, have, if you have standard four, and you're trying to reach out the class, that, that's the, they think you want to be recognized, and they might just do you a favor. Are you following me? A friend of mine says, you know, I... I drive a BMW, very expensive one, and I park it next to a shack, and I sit, and I sit down, and we talk, and they even forget that I came driving a BMW. I don't know why he drives a BMW to go talk to those people, but maybe he's making a statement that, listen, this thing is useless. What's important is what we're doing here, interaction. But with the same BMW, you can go next door where there's double story and reach out to those. Now, here's my point. Forget about the illustrations. Here's my point. Develop yourself if you want to be a good preacher and be able to reach out to the learned and the, the not so learned. How's that? Now, I'm saying this because people have a tendency of thinking, for me to be the best preacher, I must not be educated. I must not develop myself. If I can read my Bible, that's what we are told by missionaries. So no, don't go to school. You can read, 
That's fine. You go and preach. That's true. That's in your history. You go and preach now. That's enough. When they start getting more education, they'll become too clever. You can teach the Sabbath school lesson. Go. That's enough. And they were arguing. They were saying that once they get so educated, they even leave ministry and they don't want to... Um, Christ placed the things of this life in their true relation as subordinate to those of eternal, of eternal interest, but he did not ignore their importance. Is, isn't that powerful, beloved? That here you are talking about heavenly things, but you don't regard earthly things as not important. So that's because I come from heaven. I can only deal with uh, uh, celestial issues. I'm not going to deal with issues of poverty. Now, those issues are important to us. And he says here, he did not ignore their importance, but he put them in a subordinate uh, relationship that these are subordinate to these, I, I would say earthly and heavenly. But they are still important. They are still important. It's important for you to have a girlfriend and a boyfriend. I can't stand there and say, uh, Christ was not married. You are not Christ. It's important for you to, to have a girlfriend. And when you have issues with a boyfriend, it's important for me to help you walk through those issues. But I can also tell you that life is not about having a boyfriend. There's a bigger issue than having a boyfriend. I with me now, I'm subordinating that to eternal interest. But at the same time, I don't regard it as not important. So if preaching is going to be that kind of preaching, then people are able to listen to you because you are connecting to where they are and taking them to the unknown. All right, we are about to finish. He spoke as one who was familiar with heaven, conscious of his relationship to God, yet recognizing his unity with every member of the human family. He knew that I am from heaven. He knew that I am God. He knew his, that he had an intimate relationship with God, yet he recognized his unity with every member of the human family. Linked his interest with those of humanity. I'm left with seven minutes. I'm going to give you a chance to ask questions because if we don't ask questions, it will look as if I was preaching. <laughs> and that is not right. Because I wasn't preaching, all right? But I sounded as if I'm preaching at some point. You, you noticed? Because you're almost saying amen also. But it was just trying to say, why is Christ the best preacher? And that Christ, by the way, is your friend. He's not like he's dead. He's still alive. He's interested in your life. He's in. Now that you are hurt and, 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 and disorganized by pimples, Christ feels for you. He wants to work with you. Deal with that. It, does, it may look so small, but if it's big in your eyes, it is big in the eyes of Christ as well. So we're not talking about an earthly Christ who once lived and disappeared. We're talking about the Christ who lives today, who died, resurrected, and ever lives today. And he's still the same Christ who is interested in your issues. There's no reason, beloved. There's no reason. Now, one of the saddest things is to see a person commit suicide. That's the most painful thing. There's no reason for us to do that. Because we're all here. But besides that, there's no reason for us to do that because Christ cares. He does. And some of us are so afraid of Christ that we don't even want to walk with him. Even when friends ask us, are you a Christian? We're afraid to say that because Christ is associated with, 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 with uh, things that don't make sense. I can't be at UWC and say I'm a Christian because they will laugh at me. No, no, Christ is interested in your academic achievement. He is interested in your education. Let me even say this because it has come uh, more than once, um, now and again, often. When a person is looking for a wife, for a husband, some of you are not married because you're waiting for Mr. Wright. That's fine, wait. Uh, Miss Wright. <laughs> Wait, and the longer you wait, the more difficult you'll find one. Uh, because you yourself are not... All right. Um, <laughs> you, know, you know what happens is you... you what am I trying to say? <laughs> you are looking for a partner, and you are afraid to pray to God. Because he might just give you a spiritual person who's ugly. You say, you, God looks at the heart. <laughs> you, know, you know what a 
has happened, beloved? Let me, let me be honest with you. And that's the problem that we are facing with in preaching. We are preaching Christ who is a joke to people. And they don't, they don't want to hear about him. You know, let me tell you what, what young people say generally. When you start preaching to them, they say, Pastor, what's the word? You remember? Pastor B, re, realistic. Said, be realistic. When they say be realistic, they said, stop, stop that. that has, that's not for us. Be realistic. So when you talk about Christ, you talk about a person who's not realistic. Oh, Christ is realistic, beloved. If there's a person who's realistic, it's Christ. Now, I can't kneel down and ask for a wife from Christ. He'll give me an ugly person. So what I want to do, because I know what is beauty, he doesn't. He only looks at the heart. Now, I look at the outside. So I define what beauty, and then I'm going to do this. I'm going to pick a beautiful woman, and then I ask him to transform the heart. <laughs> and then we are all happy. I've got my face. He's got his heart. Now, one of the things we do in preaching is to make the Bible a wonderful book that you can carry at the mall. One of these days, we'll do evangelism quiet, silently, just carrying your Bible into the mall. We just walk with your Bible and we just greet people. All you do, just carry, dress nicely. <laughs> with your high heels, those you can manage. But, but, but carry your Bible it makes a big statement. It makes a big statement. Now, one of the things we do in preaching is let people fall in love with the Bible. And I read the Bible and it says, Joseph was beautiful in, in appearance, in form, and in appearance. And it says there in the Bible that Sarah was beautiful in appearance and in form. And then we are told that God is the author of that which is beautiful. He authored beauty. And we are told in our lessons that God is the artist. He just enjoys doing beautiful things. And then you come and tell me that God is not interested in you getting a beautiful person. When he created beauty, the concept of beauty was orig originated from God. It came from his mind. Let me tell you something. Now, there are people who are ugly. That's true. But let me tell you, the moment you walk with God... It's true. I'm not just sermonizing it. The moment you walk with God, God has a way of massaging even your ugly features. That's true. There are people you see for the first time and they look ugly. Eh? They look ugly for the first time. <laughs> but you get to know the person. Eh? You get to know the person. You see the beauty, the, the care, the knowledge, the depth of reasoning. And all of a sudden, she becomes beautiful. That's true. But there are others. When you see them, wow. In my language, it's mamlambo. Like a mermaid. <laughs> She's beautiful. Wow. But as you get to know the person, as you get to know the person, it's like, uh, full of complaints, measuring herself against others. I'm not like this. I don't like this. You know, people like people, they say, uh, I don't want him. She just drains me. You know, there are people when you come there with full strength and you feel so drained. Because every conversation is about them. And they become ugly. But not so when you walk with Christ. Maybe at the first, yeah, you may look ugly. But as you interact and you talk, it's wow, wow, he blessed me. I mean, the thought, the way he looked at this. And, and when people hear that, when people are blessed by your presence, you can't be ugly. You can't be. Look at your friends. I'm talking about your friend. Your friend is beautiful. That's why she's your friend. And your wife is beautiful. That's why she's your wife. To others, she may not be. That's fine. But until they know what I know, they may not appreciate the fact that she's beautiful. Beloved, I wanted to end on that so that we don't feel that there are people who are ugly. Beloved, when this Bible becomes a friend of the preacher, it will be a friend to those who are listening. 
So you can open your Bible. We say text him. And read it. God bless you. So we can be able to come back again. Probably this is where we end. That's my girlfriend. Don't worry. <laughs> All right. We're going to pray uh, as we end our service. Should we pray? Or you want to sing another one? Sing. Eh? There'll be a song. Maybe let's just pray for, for this part and then we'll have a song and then maybe we'll end with prayer at the end. All right. You wanted to ask a question? You have got one minute, then we end. Yeah, in other words, the question is, we may not use his parables, we'll use our parables. Yeah, in other words, we will not talk about the farmer went to sow, because we are in Mowbray, we've never seen a farmer. We will talk about a person who got into a taxi on his way to Claremont. In other words, those are illustrations. We'll talk about that tomorrow. Those are illustrations. Yes, sir. Those are illustrations. In other words, we can use illustrations. We will talk about illustrations. The importance of using illustrations. It means they say no. <laughs> In other words, it could be that you did not explain well. It could be that you did not understand well. Or refuses to understand. All right, so, so he says no, he says no. Even with Christ, there are people who couldn't understand what he said. They said, crucify him. They had a problem with him. doesn't mean because you are communicating well, everybody will buy what you are saying. Buying is another story. They may hear, but decide not to buy. All right. Okay, the, I, I'm not being honest now. The last one, really honest. Yeah. It is because we have the Holy Spirit that we need education. So the question is, why, why do we need education when we have the Holy Spirit? Here's the answer. It is because we have the Holy Spirit. That is why we need education. Because one of the functions of the Holy Spirit is to educate us. All right? So the Holy Spirit creates an appetite for development. Not only spiritually, but also mentally and physically. Because when we were created, we were created physically okay, mentally okay, and emotionally, spiritually okay. So when Christ dies on the cross, he's not only reaching out to your spiritual life, he's also trying to help you understand maths by dying on the cross. The whole being is saved, not certain parts. So Christ dies on the cross, we preach, so that as we preach, you will go and do your homework <laughs> and do it very well. That's true what he asked. Some people say, I've got the Holy Spirit, I don't need education. That Holy Spirit is a wrong Holy Spirit. <laughs> because my Holy Spirit is educated, and when he possesses you, you will also want to be educated. <laughs> Amen? Amen? God bless you. Let us bow our heads and pray together. Our kind and loving Father, what a joy for us to be meeting on this cold, dark night on a Friday here in this place. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us. We're talking about these things, Lord, just to make them simple to understand what we are, we are doing. But above that, it is for us, Lord, to find joy in walking with you. Because if we cannot find joy, if we cannot see the meaning and significance of, of walking with you, we can never share that with anyone. And we pray, dear Father, that even as we try to communicate Christ to people, may we also enjoy and have a fuller and a deeper experience with the same Christ. Now some of us seated here may have challenges and problems and difficulties that we are facing, Lord. My prayer is, even as we talk about preaching, may those issues be addressed and may they feel that this weekend was also an answer to some of their issues and their concerns. That 
we will not only be better preachers and presenters of your word, but we will also be presentable because we claim to be your children. Bless us now, Lord, and, and bring us again tomorrow. In Christ we pray. Amen. God bless you. But don't go out. It's not the end of the program.